Keep your eyes peeled, boy. You never know when you might see bad guys. What's that? Drug dealers! Selling drugs to kids in the woods, those villains! All right, boy, we're gonna take down those drug dealers. You ready to attack? All right, put on your mean face, because we're gonna take down those bad guys. You ready? And go, attack! Get those drug dealers, sick them, go get them! Go get, tear them apart. Go get those drug dealers. Get them, sick them, attack those guys. Go get those drug dealers. Now's your chance. Go get them. Go tear them limb from limb. Go get those evil drug dealers. Show them no mercy. Go get them, boy. Go get them. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is a show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. This video was made possible by my supporters on Patreon. Without their help, I really could not do these videos. Their support allows me to acquire toys to review, update my equipment, pay my bills, Eat. The winner of the most recent Patreon poll was Mutt, version 3. This figure was part of the Drug Elimination Force, DEF. In the 90s, G.I. Joe tried to get involved with the social issues of the time. It's a bit awkward now, especially with DEF. Our approach to addiction has evolved quite a bit since the early 90s. It's now generally accepted that these simple anti-drug messages don't work. Despite this, DEF gave us some surprisingly good figures, and this is one of them. A HCC 788 presents Mutt and Junkyard. This is Mutt and Junkyard, G.I. Joe's canine officer and attack dog from 1992. This figure and the dog companion were available only in 1992. They were discontinued for 1993. They were part of the G.I. Joe sub-team Drug Elimination Force. This is the third version of Mutt and Junkyard. There were four total versions of Mutt and Junkyard in the vintage era. Version 1 of Mutt and Junkyard were released in 1984. It was one of the first G.I. Joe action figures to include an animal companion. He wasn't the only figure to include an animal that year. Spirit was also released in 1984, and he included the eagle named Freedom. Version 2 of Mutt and Junkyard were released in 1989 as part of the Slaughter's Marauders subset. They used the same mold as version 1, but Mutt was in Slaughter's Marauders colors, with the light green, dark green, brown, and blue. Also, his hair changed color for some reason, don't worry about it, it changed back. Version 3 from 1992 is the one we are looking at in this review. It was a totally new sculpt, and it was part of the G.I. Joe sub-team Drug Elimination Force, shortened to DEF. We will talk more about DEF momentarily. The final vintage version was version 4 from 1993. This was part of the Battle Core set. It used the same mold as version 3. It had some updated colors and accessories. The second year of DEF figures scheduled for 1993 was cancelled, and the figures that were going to be in that set were rolled into Battle Core. Mutt is quite the little joiner. Three of the four versions were part of sub-teams. Well, sort of. Battle Core was the name given to the main line of G.I. Joe figures in 1993, so it wasn't really a sub-team. Even so, half of the vintage figures were part of dedicated subsets. Drug Elimination Force, or DEF, was a sub-team of G.I. Joe introduced in 1992. It was part of G.I. Joe's new social awareness in the early 90s. In 1991, G.I. Joe added the Eco Warriors, which had an environmental theme. The new decade saw G.I. Joe try to tackle the real issues of the day. The war on drugs was very much in full swing in 1992 when G.I. Joe joined the fight. This series was no doubt considered progressive and educational at the time. Now it seems very dated. We have a much more mature understanding of addiction now than we did back then. The leader of DEF was Bulletproof, a figure I quite liked. The enemy of DEF was Headman and his Headhunters. In 1993, Headman got a new henchman, Gristle. Headman was not part of Cobra. In media, he was portrayed as the enemy of G.I. Joe and Cobra. Despite this, later versions of the Headhunters were Cobra Troopers. Drug dealers were cliché bad guys in a lot of 80s and 90s movies and TV shows. 
Lazy writers could always pit the hero against drug dealers, and no other effort was needed to establish they were bad. It's something the Naked Gun movies poked fun at. This week he is being honored for his 1,000th drug dealer killed. Uh, in, in all honesty, the last two I backed over with my car. Luckily, they turned out to be drug dealers. The would-be second wave of DEF figures that were folded into Battle Corps in 1993 were mostly just color variations of the earlier releases, but they did include different accessories and different cards, so I think they qualify as updated versions and not just variations. The first Mutt action figure in 1984 included an animal companion, the Dog Junkyard. He was one of the first G.I. Joe figures to include an animal. Since then, there have been many G.I. Joe and Cobra figures that include animals. One of the most famous was Snake Eyes version 2 from 1985 with the wolf Timber. For Mutt, it makes sense. His job is a dog handler, so he should include a dog. Not all animal companions fit as well. 1990 Undertow included a fish. Version 1 of Mutt and Junkyard were designed by Ron Rudat for Hasbro. The character was going to be a Cobra canine trooper, but was changed to a G.I. Joe character in pre-production. In some concept drawings, he is wearing a cap that is similar to the one on the version 3 figure. A Mutt is a mixed breed dog. A pre-production alternate code name for Mutt was Dog Face. Junkyard is a reference to a junkyard dog, which is a very mean dog that guards junkyards and scrapyards. Pre-production alternate code names for Junkyard included Dog, D-A-W-G, and George. This is another case where the final code name was way better than the alternatives. Mutt did not originally have a law enforcement role, but his specialty overlaps some law enforcement functions. He was not an MP, but his replacement, Law, was an MP, and he included the dog, Order. Since Mutt's job as a dog handler can apply to law enforcement, it makes sense that he's in DEF. However, Law and Order, the actual law enforcement specialists, were not in DEF. K and Nine refers primarily to police dog and police dog units. It's a simplified form of the word canine, which is a dog. The word sounds like the letter K and the number nine, so the word is often shortened to that. Dogs to the layperson. This dog is not a pet. This is a working animal. The U.S. Armed Forces use dogs for reconnaissance and bomb detection. In law enforcement, they would also sniff out drugs and track fleeing suspects. I have the card back for this figure, so let's take a look at it. It's larger than a standard G.I. Joe card because it came with a lot of stuff. It has some familiar 90s style card art, and it has a purple laser background. It has the G.I. Joe logo at the top, and it has a large D.E.F. logo. This is Mutt and Junkyard, and this is number three in the DEF series. Figures in the 90s were numbered for some reason, as if you had to collect them in a specific order. According to the price tags, this was $4.99 at Toys R Us, which is expensive for a carded G.I. Joe figure. It looks like it didn't sell for that, so it was marked down to $1.98, which is cheap for a carded G.I. Joe figure. Either Mutt or DEF or G.I. Joe or Hasbro is a member of the Partnership for a Drug-Free American. America. The front of the card advertises electronic battle flash net launcher batteries included. In the space behind where the figure was packaged, there are some instructions for the use of the figure stand and the net launcher. The back of the card has the cross cell. There's a partition for the DEF figures and then the other figures that were available at the time. Oh, it turns out G.I. Joe is a member of the Partnership for a Drug-Free America. There is an advertisement that says watch the new adventures of G.I. Joe on TV. There is a 90s style flag point and a 90s style file card. We will read that later. There is a list of features and accessories on here, and I will refer to this when describing those things. Under the file card, there's this other clip and save section. It's a communique from Bulletproof the DEF leader. Real Americans don't do drugs, except for Falcon. Fake Americans can do all the drugs they want. G.I. Joe says that you must refuse all drugs no matter who offers them to you, even if it's aspirin and even if it's your mom. These anti-drug messages on the DEF cards is why we no longer have drugs in America today.
Let's take a look at Mutt's accessories, starting with this pistol. The pistol is in black plastic. It's not very well detailed, but it's adequate. The card calls this a U.S. Army 9mm semi-automatic pistol. That is not very specific. It's probably supposed to be a Beretta M9, which was adopted as the U.S. service pistol in 1985. It doesn't exactly look like a Beretta. This pistol does not fit in my figure's hand. I have tried it with the other examples of Mutt version 3 that I have, and it still doesn't fit. I'm not going to force it because I don't want to break the figure's thumb. The next accessory is is not an accessory. It is the dog, Junkyard, the attack dog. It is a black, soft, flexible plastic. It is the same mold as version 1 of Junkyard, but that version was in hard plastic and it had a brown paint spray on the belly. This version does not have that. It's a really good sculpt, if a little undetailed. It has no articulation. G.I. Joe animals didn't have articulation at that time. I don't mind that it's made of a softer plastic. Plastic. I wish more G.I. Joe animals were made of that softer plastic. They would have been less prone to breaking. Junkyard was already trained to track bad guys and detect bombs. In DEF, he would have the added role of sniffing out illegal narcotics. Version 1 and version 2 each had a leash, but I guess he doesn't need that anymore because he's such a good boy. To quickly tell the difference among these, version 1 is in hard plastic with a brown paint spray on the belly. Version 2 Two is in a hard plastic with no paint spray on the belly, and version 3 is in soft plastic, no paint spray on the belly. The next accessory is the spring-loaded net launcher. It is very large. It is in blue plastic. It has a ton of technical detail all over it. It's double-barreled, and it has a translucent blue top. You can see the mechanism in there with the two batteries. There is at least one variant, another in my possession has a translucent green top, and I do not see this variation listed in online resources. The final card calls this a sophisticated dual-firing net launcher. Well, it thinks it's sophisticated. It's kind of full of itself. A real bore at parties. The net launcher is spring-loaded, and it fires these two black missiles with a net connected to them. I'm going to release them. I will show you the firing mechanism later, but I want to show you this first. The net launcher fires these large black plastic projectiles with a green mesh fabric net between them. The projectiles are attached to opposite corners of the net, and on the other corners there are these two black balls for weights, and the way this is supposed to work is when the net is launched, it should spread out to capture the target. There's another potential variation. The net that came with the other launcher I have is in a different shade of green. This is different from the typical spring-loaded missile launcher from 1990s G.I. Joe. It's a creative use of the gimmick. Instead of firing a missile to take down an enemy, it fires a net. It's a non-lethal weapon, which fits DEF's law enforcement theme. These DEF launchers had an electronic gimmick. It has a translucent top because it will light up when you press the trigger. Mine just barely still works. Here it is with less light. You can see it a lot better. These are standard size watch batteries, so you can replace them if you want. Let's demonstrate how to use this launcher. We usually fire at Dr. Mindbender, but DEF takes out drug dealers, so let's fire at a drug dealer. Let's use Gristle. To load it, press the projectiles into the barrels with the notch side up, press them back until they click. You've got to put both of them in that way, so all the way in. And then you have this cavity in front, and that is for the weighted balls. You just press those in there. And now you have a net that is ready to fire. The trigger is in the back, so let's take aim at Gristle and see if we can catch him in the net. That really did not work at all, so let's try it again. We've got to take this guy down. He is selling drugs to kids who are smaller and defenseless, so we can't let that go on. Out of the way, kid, we've got to take down a drug dealer. Let's take aim at Gristle and fire. Well, I hit him with a projectile, which would defeat the non-lethal nature of this weapon, and I did knock him down, but that's not the same as catching him in the net, so I'm going to try it one more time. All right, Gristle, stop or my mom will shoot. 
Okay, so that doesn't work. Uh, we definitely took out Gristle, but we hit him with the projectile, so he is dead. This is a nice idea. It's a really cute and clever way to use the spring-loaded gimmick, but the net itself doesn't actually seem to work as advertised. That's right, drug dealer. I bet you didn't expect to get caught in that tiny net. Now give me them drugs. Junkyard, back off. Them drugs ain't for you. I said back off, dog. Junkyard, I said back off. You give me them drugs, you hear me? Give me them drugs. That is not a toy. Drop it. Drop it. Oh, no. He's cocaine, dog. The final accessory is the figure stand. The figure came with a black figure stand, and this was nice. Figure stands were harder to come by in the 80s, but 90s figures actually came with them, and that's great. With the accessories out of the way, let's take a look at the articulation on Mutt. Junkyard did not have any articulation. This figure had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures well before 1992, so he could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could move his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow, so he could bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. This was an O-ring figure, meaning the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside so he could move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Mutt, starting with his head. And on his head, he has a black cap with black headphones and a black microphone on the left side that's sculpted on and painted that's not a separate microphone piece thankfully he has a black mustache the face sculpt looks enough like the first version that you could believe this is the same guy version one had a removable helmet and face mask the cap on version three is not removable but i don't mind that it looks similar to a cap mutt wore a few times in the comic book series this is an update that entirely makes sense for this character on his chest he has a blue vest over a dark green shirt with an elastic collar. The file card calls this a life vest flak jacket. On the upper left side of the vest, there is a black grenade. The file card calls this a 100 foot effective smoke bomb. There is a zipper down the center and two pockets, one on each side, and each pocket has a black buckle. There are these black details on the upper right side of the vest, and I wasn't sure what these were, but the card art and the file card reveal these are dog biscuits. The file card calls these protein enriched energy boosting dog biscuits yep Right there, Mutt has a couple milk bones for Junkyard on his vest. His arms feature long, dark green sleeves and dark green extended elbow pads. Those are really cool, very well done. I like that a lot. His forearms have caramel brown colored padding. And on the right side, on the inside of the forearm, there is some stitching. And on the outside, there are some bite marks. That's a really cool detail. The file card calls this forearm padding for canine attack training. It perfectly fits his specialty. We finish up looking at the arms with some black gloves. The waist piece features light green trousers and a black belt and a black belt buckle. There is a small black pouch on the right hip and an even smaller pouch on the left side. And then there's this black detail on the left side. It's hard to make out exactly what that's supposed to be. There's no listing for it on the file card, but based on the card art, I think that might be a dog whistle. His legs feature light green trousers with seams down the outside upper legs. On the lower legs, over his shins and the tops of his boots, he has caramel brown padding. The file card calls this lower leg anti-bite shin and foot pads. There are brown straps that go around the back of the leg, and those pads are over black boots. There's a possible variation. Yojo.com shows this figure with tan legs. Mark Belomo's Ultimate Guide to G.I. Joe describes the figure as having tan 
tan pants, even though they look green in the photo. I have only found this figure with green legs. I have three examples of Mutt version 3, and they all have green legs. I was able to find a sealed example of a tan Mutt, but it was not a North American release. It was from Greece. It may have been an international exclusive. I've not been able to find any sealed examples on US or Canadian cards. The colors on this figure are almost identical to the colors on the Slaughter's Marauders Mutt version 2. You have the light green, dark green, brown, black, and a blue vest. I really like this coordination of colors. It shows some effort went into this figure, and I really appreciate that. They kept the colors from an earlier version and made smart updates. This is a good figure, and a believable later version of Mutt. Now let's look at the file card, and this is where it gets a little confusing. There are some unresolvable discrepancies between this file card and the two earlier versions. For starters, we have a close-up portrait of Mutt here, along with the numbered list of the features and accessories. The codename is Mutt and Junkyard. They are the canine officer and attack dog. The file name is Stanley G. Perlmutter. Primary military specialty is canine officer. Second military specialty is infantry, birthplace is Iceland, New Jersey, and his grade is E5. Well, that seems wrong. On the version file card, his middle initial is R. The rest of the information is mostly the same. His primary military specialty is dog handler rather than canine officer, but secondary military specialty is still infantry and the same birthplace. His grade was specialist 4, not E5. The strangeness really starts with the version 2 file card, which changes his middle initial to G without explanation, and and changes his grade to E5 that was copied over to the version 3 card. It's not just that. The version 2 file card describes some of Mutt's background and his total control over dogs. That does not contradict the version 1 card, but it almost seems like it's describing a different person. The version 3 card talks about his long experience with Junkyard and does seem to describe the same person as version 1, but with the initial change and the grade change from version 2. And the series Serial number for version 3 and version 2 are the same, so you figure it out. Good luck. It says Vehicle Specialty, G.I. Joe Supersonic Fort America Driver, and that is this. The vehicle slash playset for G.I. Joe's Supersonic Fighters, it was available in 1992, but it was not in DEF, it was in the Supersonic Fighters, which was a totally different subset with an electronic sound-making gimmick. Why would Mutt drive this? This section has a quote, presumably from Mutt himself. It says, Taking drugs is stupid, but dealing drugs is outright evil. Somebody has to try to stop it, and might as well be me. He has nothing else to do this weekend. They cut out the quote from Junkyard. It said, ruff, 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 ruff. This paragraph says, Mutt and Junkyard have worked together for so long they no longer need to give each other audible or visible signals. It's almost as if they function as one organism. On DEF operations, Junkyard sniffs out contraband substances and sets up the bad guys so Mutt can tank them down with his dual net launcher. If the bad guys decide to put up a fight, they better be prepared to get ripped to shreds by a howling savage beast and then they'll have to contend with the dog. This is one of the better 90s file cards. I like that it shows the maturity of Mutt and Junkyard's working relationship. The inconsistencies with earlier file cards is a little confusing, but it is well written. Looking at how Mutt and Junkyard were used in G.I. Joe Media, they first appeared in Revenge of Cobra Part 1 briefly. They had more of a role in Part 2. They were trapped by Destro's creeping vines. They escaped and encountered shipwreck. They appeared in quite a few episodes, having a cute animal on the show provided a lot of opportunity for comedy. Their most prominent episode was Cobra's Creatures. In that episode, Cobra takes over animals in yet another harebrained plan to take over the world. Junkyard goes Cujo on Mutt. It was a good way to bring in all of the animal companions in the series for one episode. Mutt appeared in his version 2 uniform in the Deke miniseries Operation Dragonfire. DEF appeared in the two-part story The Greatest Evil Evil Parts 1 and 2. In those episodes, the drug kingpin headman is selling a drug called Spark. Both G.I. Joe and Cobra agents become addicted. Drugs are so evil, G.I. Joe and Cobra teamed up to stop it. It was a rare occasion when a character died in the cartoon. 
Headman became a victim of his own product. In the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, Mud and Junkyard first appeared in issue number 25. They were with a team that was sent on a mission to investigate Zartan's cabin in the swamps of the Florida Everglades. In the early appearances, Junkyard was not very obedient. He often ran off on his own. He even befriended Destro before leading Cobra Command into quicksand. He wasn't very obedient, but he was smart. Also in those early appearances, Mutt sometimes wore a cap that was similar to the one on his version 3 figure. In issue number 73, Mutt appeared in his version 1 uniform, but it was recolored brown. In future issues where he wore the version 1 uniform, it usually had that brown color. The color change looks good. Mud and Junkyard were in issue number 79. Buzzer slashed Junkyard with a chainsaw. You can always tell the bad guys because they hate dogs. Fortunately, Junkyard recovered. In issue numbers 99 through 103, Mutt, Junkyard, and Spirit got caught up in Cobra's attempt to take over the town of Millville while visiting Mutt's uncle. Mutt appeared in his version 3 uniform in issue number 124. DEF had a short run in the comic book series. They appeared in issues number 124 and 125. They shared pages with Eco Warriors and Ninja Force. Honestly, it seems that the writer of the series, Larry Hama, just wanted to get the DEF story over with so he could move on. Mutt fought against Cobra's attack on G.I. Joe headquarters in issue number 131, again in his version 3 uniform. After that, he appeared a few more times in his version 1 uniform, usually with the brown color. Looking at Mutt and Junkyard overall, I think this set is mostly really good. I think the figure is great. The colors are not bad for law enforcement. He's not camouflaged, but he's not supposed to be. The use of Slaughter's Marauders colors is a surprising callback to an earlier figure. The sculpting is sharp. I like almost everything about this figure. The dog biscuits on the vest are kind of silly, but that's my only complaint. This thing is awesome. The accessories are better than expected, too. I'm not a fan of the spring-loaded missile gimmick, but this is a very creative way to use it. It's a non-lethal weapon for law enforcement, not for combat. It is unique and interesting, and the light-up feature is just a bonus. The pistol accessory also seems more like a law enforcement weapon. Some actual thought went into this accessory set. Junkyard is basically the same as version 1, but in a softer plastic and with no paint spray. I don't mind that so much. I wish more G.I. Joe accessories came in the softer plastic. They would break less frequently. Junkyard is a character. He is as important as Mutt, so I'm happy to see him featured here with his original sculpt. Mutt was never a very important character in G.I. Joe media, but he had his moments. Junkyard always stole the spotlight. You know what they say, never work with kids or animals. The 1990s was a rough decade for G.I. Joe. The whole concept of D.E.F. is a bit dated and cringy now. The figures, though, were really good. Too often I have to point out the laziness of 1990s toys, but not this time. Some real thought and effort went into this. We looked at the Eco Warriors last week. That's another sub-team with a social message. The Eco Warriors toys are obnoxious and gimmicky, but the environmentalist message message of the Eco Warriors has aged a lot better than the anti-drug message of DEF. It's not that an anti-drug message is necessarily bad, but we approach these issues a lot differently now. That was my review of the DEF Mutt and Junkyard. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and share this video with your friends. That's what helps this channel grow. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. This video and all of my videos would not be possible without the support of my friends on Patreon. Their support allows me to continue doing these videos and literally allows me to continue to live. So thank you to all of my supporters supporters on Patreon. If you would like to support the channel, that's a great way to do it. You can get some special perks and get your name in videos like the names you see scrolling on the screen right now. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.
He's high on drugs and he's trying to get the dog biscuits on my vest. It was a bad choice to wear dog biscuits on my body. Somebody help me for the love of 